Well, th thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am going to use the microphone, even though there are uh, not, not tons of people, because it helps our translators. Uh, if you would like translation in Arabic, there are headphones for you there, and they're very happy to provide that service, because uh, my Arabic is limited to uh, the phrase that my wife taught me. She was an archaeologist and dug in Baba Dra, so uh, it was very important for our, for our children to know what Yala Shabab means, but other than that, that's the... Uh, you knew you were in very big trouble in our house when you were yelled Yala Shabab to hurry up and move along. <laughs> yala Yala. <laughs> yeah. So my, my Arabic is limited to that in Shukran. But thank you for coming. Shukran. We're going to be talking today about uh, interdisciplinary learning. Um, and it's a, a very complicated field, to be honest. And many people have many ideas about it. If you read the literature, you will find lots of contested ideas. Uh, starting with what to call it, because there are all kinds of names that you will see. Even if you're a part of the, um, uh, of the International Baccalaureate, you will see a variety of names sort of rolling around this idea of a connected curriculum. You will hear transdisciplinarity, and you will hear interdisciplinarity, and you will hear multidisciplinarity. Um, and a variety of other terms that are not so, uh, not so common. But they're all getting at this same idea that when you go through school, by the time you're in middle school, really, which is the middle years program that you'll see that I work with in the IB, by 11 or 12 years old, most uh, school systems in the world have decided that you must start chopping up your experience of the world into specific academic disciplines. Uh, sometimes there are good reasons for that because there are lots of things to know about disciplines. It's, um, uh, there are ways of thinking and there are vocabularies and there are communities of practice that means that math class looks and sounds significantly different than um, music class. Although obviously there are a lot of connections between them. You probably, if you went around to a school and you took all of the signs off the door, if you walked into what was happening in that classroom learning area, you could probably make a pretty good guess as to what was the subject. Um, that follows, of course, all the way on into university when people uh, choose a major usually, uh, a discipline, something that you learn to do that's different than the people who might be studying something else. Now, sometimes these disciplines are quite arbitrary. So, for example, I learned when I was uh, thinking about this uh, from the graduate school class that I was teaching. Um, in the United States and in many countries, you always learn math in this order. Algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. Yes? Although, of course, algebra, geometry, and trigonometry are really all the same thing, <laughs> expressed in different ways sometimes. But the original red book at Harvard University, which is where the American traditional curriculum was organized, was organized alphabetically. And so you study algebra, geometry, and trigonometry in English. Uh, for no good reason, to be honest, other than that they were, that's the way the curriculum has always been done. And if you're a teacher of math, of course, you will know how those subjects interrelate. And they are different, but there's no reason why you must do them exactly in that order. You might start with geometry first, for example, it's possible. Um, and so how we name the disciplines and how we use them in practice is always changing. Of course, new disciplines are always coming too. Right? Uh, there was a time when, uh, hi, when molecular biology was not a discipline. Okay, you'd like to take ours? Yes. Yes, you may, Thank certainly. You. Yep. Uh, molecular biology or uh, oceanography were not disciplines, but now they are. You can have a major in that, you can have a career in those things. You can take courses that are called that. In classical, um, uh, in, the, in the classical university setting that comes to us from Aristotle, uh, there, there were uh, six classical disciplines and they had to do with rhetoric and um, uh, what we would call natural sciences. And some of those things we've carried forward, others we've changed their name because we have a different way of thinking about the world. So it's a long, complicated story to say that I'm not quite sure what you want to call this, but there are two truths that underlie this way of thinking about education. 
One is that we have to chop it up somehow into bits because there's more to learn about a particular way of thinking or a particular subject matter than you should just go to school and sit in the same room all day with one person knowing everything and you can have a class. That's the truth. And universities uh, are divided into disciplines and students go to study particular topics or, or um, fields, of, fields of knowledge and understanding. That's true. At the same time, once you leave school, and I'm counting university even as school there, once you leave school, the world doesn't divide itself neatly into seven one-hour blocks so that you go to math class for today's problem and science class for tomorrow's problem and English class for the next day's problem and art class for the next day's problem. We experience the world as a, as a unified whole. And even more complicated than that, of course, the problems that the world faces today, the challenges that we and our students have to face together, are not neatly divided into disciplines. We're going to take a little bit later um, a look at um, water, water resource management as a, as a, as a challenge. Um, but when we do, you will find that it's not enough to approach that merely through a single discipline. So how do we help, how do we do this with our students? How do we find a way to be disciplinary in our approach so that you can get the proper depth of understanding to the curriculum and still find a way to be interdisciplinary, to find a way to connect the pieces that happen across. My focus of education is on 11 to 16 year olds, the, the middle grade, someplace when they're no longer little children but not really ready to go to university yet. It's a time of really rapid change in the way most cultures deal with education because they, they move from being primary students where usually there's one or a, a small team of teachers and their experience of the world is very much shaped by that single source of information and understanding. You have my teacher. But all of a sudden around 11, 12 years old in year five or year six of education, we begin to have multiple teachers, teachers. And all of those teachers have different rules and all of them have different things they want to tell us and we all have different kinds of homework and different ways of managing that. Developmentally, it's a very big change for early adolescents to move from this unified way of looking at the world to chopping it into, into um, analyzable parts so you can learn about it in greater depth. So it's very important for this age group that we find some way to help them connect the pieces back together. Because we're very busy institutionally and intellectually chopping the world into smaller and smaller bits. So what I want to think with you about today is how we manage that. I'm not sure why the computer's gone to sleep, excuse me. And so uh, that's why I say two things. Uh, first, is all, first of all, is going to be try it out. We have a ni the luxury of lots of space and nice people to work with and plenty of time. So I'm going to ask you to help me to think about how to teach interdisciplinarily on this issue of water resource management. That's going to be one of the things we do. We also will try it out to see how we might be able to um, assess interdisciplinary learning. Because it's all well and good to want to do it, but how would you know if you've done it very well? It's, a, it's really a complicated task. And in the IB, we have, through the middle years program, we've um, come up with what we think is a, a very disciplined way to do <coughs> interdisciplinary learning. And I want to share that with you today. If you're part of an IB World School, that's great. But if you're not, that's even better because we're very interested in this, not just as a way to um, be a part of the IB programs, but also as a way to strengthen teaching and learning across educational communities. And very anxious for people to take these ideas and to try them and to see if they work in your experience, to find other ways of using this, uh, this, this framework. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it first and I have a few handouts, really one per table because I want to encourage the collaboration that you have with other people. Um, and most of them are for, for reference for when I ask you to try it out. So, I'm going to talk about it first, then I'll give out the handout, give you a chance to talk about it briefly at your tables, then we'll move on to the next idea. Okay? 
Now, would you, uh, if you were sitting with someone, would you please introduce yourself? They may be an old time friend, but at least you can say hello after lunch to make sure that you know who's at or near your table. Maybe you could come join so you can have a, uh, a conversation partner. Please say hello to each other because it's no fun to sit as if we're uh, mystery guests. Are you going to share? Thank you very much. So in the, in the time that we have, these are the, the five goals that we have. I'm going to be looking at a rationale, and I've shared some of that with you already. Um, I want to share a particular framework. There, as I said, there are lots of ways to think about interdisciplinary learning, but this is um, all the things we will do together are based on a very clear theoretical conception of how it's supposed to work. Now, this is not the only way that it might work but it is a way to help us organize our thinking about it. We'll look at some ways to get into disciplinary study. Uh, we're gonna look at how we might assess it. And then uh, we will look just briefly at some of the aspects of the middle years program interdisciplinary examination. Because in what is either a very bold or a very foolish move, we've decided that we can actually have an examination that allows you to get at these important attri uh, attributes of interdisciplinary learning. So, first of all, why, why do we have to do this? I've made a developmental argument that it's especially appropriate for 11 to 16 year olds, but I want to extend that argument to say that it's vitally important for the way today's students think and also for the lives that they will lead and for the jobs that they will have. So if we're serious about how this works, um, it's about being able to be creative across disciplines. There's been interesting literature written in the, last, uh, in the last few months, really, about the jobs of the future and how is it that you will be able to find a job. Uh, and it becomes uh, increasingly apparent that you need two things, which often don't seem to go together. You need a very strong set of people skills, an understanding of the humanities, so how we live and work together. And you need very strong technical skills because um, eventually, the experts tell us, you can find computers who can help you to sort out your problems even. And you can find computers who will help you to figure out the data. Computers are very good at that. But where those two things intersect is humanity, creativity. And those are the things that computers, at least as far as we can imagine with our abilities now will never be able to do. So this is a, a quote from Education Week which talks about the fact that we need to be able not only to have surface knowledge but deep understanding. And one of the ways you get that deep understanding is by seeing how math is fundamentally the same and fundamentally different than music. Right? There they have things in common, things apart. And we often don't help our students think about that very critically. This is that transition between technology and liberal arts. And I found this to be true uh, in, in, in my own family's life, very strangely, within the last month. Uh, I, I'm, 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 our firstborn, our firstborn daughter, is the first of our three children, who, alhamdulillah, has a job, a real job, with health insurance and and benefits, and I'm not paying any of her bills for the first time in 25 years. So as a father, I'm very happy. But how she got this job is a very interesting story because uh, she was a, a major in history. She studied history. And so her dream was to be, uh, to run a museum. Of course, there aren't many museums. It's a very dog-eat-dog -dog world, and it's very difficult to get a job there. So for three years, she's been looking and thinking about a job. So she took herself back to school to get a degree in database management. So it's a post-baccalaureate, 18 months technology skills. Um, and un unknown to her mother and to me, she had posted her uh, resume on um, LinkedIn. And so everybody has a LinkedIn page. I thought you just did that because that was for fun, I suppose. But lo and behold, somebody found her on LinkedIn, recruited her and hired her for a job because she had a history major and a technology degree. So she's working with a company whose job it is to understand the intersection of human behavior 
and the law of large numbers so because they want to figure out how to get the right people to come to their university. So you have to understand how all the numbers work in a huge database and you have to understand the kind of diversity that's possible in human communities and the kind of ideas that people respond to. So if I want to have in the United States, uh, it often has, uh, has to do with ethnic diversity. So if I want to have 25 more um, African-American female engineers, right, how many applications do I need to receive and how many brochures do I have to mail to get those applications? And you work out the numbers in a certain way. It's all about data, but it's also all about people. So I, I have this presentation that I've been thinking, I've been talking about for a year and I, it was quite shocking to me when it happened in my own family that this, that this is actually how my daughter, who we thought might never have a job, does have a job because of this interdisciplinarity and how these things work together. So we talked a little bit about these, these terms. There are, there are scholars who put interdisciplinary understanding in a continuum that runs from completely integrated to partially integrated to not very integrated. I have to tell you that personally, uh, although even in IB publications we present it this way, I'm not completely convinced that it gets at the reality. Because it probably is a lot messier than a nice chart that puts it in, in, in three ways. But in the middle years program, we're building the idea that this is authentically interdisciplinary based on the real meaning of the word. Right? So you have disciplines, and if you have more than one, you will have the place that they overlap, the interness of it. And so interdisciplinary is how we're thinking of this, especially for 11 to 16 year olds. That, that's our focus, is interdisciplinary. So how does this work? As I described, it's really not that complicated. It's a very simple Venn diagram that you really do have disciplines, that those are real things that exist in the world, and that there are places in which you overlap them. And our theory is that that overlap is not just the things they have in common, but it's um, almost like two lenses, right? And when you, when you combine them, you get something you didn't have before. So if I have A and I have plus B, it's greater than A plus B, right? The thing that I get by looking at both disciplines together is more than I get at looking with either discipline, right? Not just the overlap, but something that's additional. So what is this not? What is this not? Would you take a moment and, and discuss with the person who's beside you how you might um, answer this question? How is interdisciplinary teaching different than thematic teaching? So you're all uh, educators, you are all have, have lots of theory and knowledge and practical understanding. How would you guess that interdisciplinary teaching is different than thematic teaching? And you can use this for a reference if you want, but I wonder if you would just have that short, very uh, theoretical conversation. What's different between interdisciplinary and thematic. Have a, have a little discussion. And sometimes it's very important to describe what something is by comparing what it is not. Right? So what interdisciplinary teaching is not, is the example here is of a coin. Uh, but I will tell you the worst interdisciplinary, not really, thematic teaching I've seen. There are two examples, one for younger children, one for older children. For the younger children, the unit was called Apples, apples. So they made apple sauce. They used apples for counting in math. They planted apple seeds in science. They read Johnny Appleseed, a story about an American folk hero in, uh, in language. Uh, and they went outside and planted an apple tree. So that's a theme. It's just all about apples, right? Apples, apples everywhere, right? But there's not actually much depth to that idea. It's just sort of a, an idea they carry across. Right? Uh, I also saw this at a senior high level. Uh, it, was, uh, it was about Chinese. So we'll eat Chinese food and we'll look at where China is on the map and we'll meet some Chinese people and we'll learn to walk like Chinese people. They did this. We'll wear Chinese clothes 
and we'll uh, eat Chinese food, yeah, in high school, yes, in high school, which of course in China is just called food, <laughs> right? It's not Chinese food, it's just food. So it wasn't very authentically intercultural, to say the least, and it also didn't help you to understand. You got nothing different or a deeper understanding of anything because you talked about it in every class. So that's not what we're talking about. It's a different, this is a much different idea. It's not thematic. Instead, it has three characteristics, right? The first is um, that it is grounded in the disciplines. So what's really important about the discipline is what is going to be put together in an interdisciplinary way. So the thing that is really at the, at the essence of being a mathematician, or that you really need to know about being a scientist, or that you want to understand about uh, being persuasive in literature. Those things are deeply rooted in the discipline. And if you don't have the discipline, you can't be interdisciplinary. Right? So that's, that's the first part of this theory. Now, the second part is that it is integrative. That it's not just apples here, apples there, apples everywhere, but that you're really thinking about how when you put this discipline together and that discipline together, you're getting something new. And it's this new thing that is the interdisciplinary understanding that you're developing. You wouldn't have had it until you put these things together. The third characteristic is that it is purposeful. You don't just do it because it's convenient to talk about apples for a while, or that's a very nice season for apples and that apples are tasty. Those are not good enough reasons to do apples everywhere. You must have a purpose for the integration. Uh, and we define some of the purposes, um, and, and we can talk about them if you like, but it's really not so important that you conform to the list that we have in the middle years program, but that you're doing it to get to some place on purpose. Maybe it can be to explain a complex phenomenon that you can't do with a single uh, discipline. Maybe it's to uh, use cross-disciplinary tooling that although I am um, a history teacher by training, I want to make sure that my students are able to manage numerical data and that they're able to construct a persuasive argument that they might actually be learning about in the literature class but I want them to, to actually apply that with valid um, and evaluated historical texts. So I would get something new when I combine the disciplines. Yes? Can we consider STEM approach? So STEM, when you're looking at science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, yeah? So if it, if it, if it were authentic interdisciplinary, so Will and I were having this discussion at breakfast this morning that often when, you, when people talk about STEM, they're really talking about S and T and E and M, not really STEM or STEAM even. So it is entirely possible to put those together in a meaningful way that's interdisciplinary. It's also possible just to line them up beside each other like toddlers in the sand pit and they're playing by themselves but never together. So you could do, but just because you call it STEM doesn't mean that it's interdisciplinary. Yeah. Exactly. So purposeful, integrative, and grounded in the disciplines. And then the third, and this is the last bit before I will move on to look at something that's, uh, that's concrete, is that there is a continuum of interdisciplinary learning. And everything doesn't have to be all out, right? There are little bits you can move along. So borrowing from other disciplines, when I was a history teacher, one of the things that we always did was to invite our art teacher in to uh, learn about perspective. Now, I had um, uh, um, uh, my own agenda because eventually I would teach the history meaning of perspective, but I at least wanted them to learn how to spell the word and what perspective means in art. So we would study the history of immigration to the United States in a time when people lived in uh, very dilapidated old buildings in the inner cities uh, slums, really, right in, in the American in, inner cities in the early, 20, uh, early 19th century. And one of the things I asked students to do was to, you know, think about your most important facts and then draw a picture of one of these things using perspective. Now, really all I was doing was borrowing from art 
to make a history point. It wasn't very integrative, but I was able to use another discipline and borrow some of their tools to get my ideas across. So that's interdis borrowing from the other disciplines. Interdisciplinary threads are more um, related. So STEM, I think, is a really good example of interdisciplinary threading. Because it's possible to do science without mathematics, but not for long, <laughs> right? Because those, those things go together. And science that is applied becomes engineering, right? And technology is the application of engineered science mathematically understood. So those things, they, they weave around, right? They weave around. In the middle years program, we also have something formally of, that we call interdisciplinary units that are very structured. Now, the world often doesn't make itself so structured, but in school, it's often helpful to follow a set of procedures and one way of doing it so that you can tease apart the process and you can get better at it bit by bit, and you can make it more complicated as you go along. So school is always meant to do that, right? We, we make it a safe place and we, we tear things apart to their part to their little bits. We make uh, steps to follow. In the real world, that, it doesn't work that way, but when we're talking especially about middle adolescents, younger adolescents, we want to help them build the mental habits that they can transfer to more complicated situations. So we have a very set way of doing it. Uh, it's not the only way. It's not necessarily even the best way, but it is the middle years program's way. Uh, and we help teachers and students to understand the process. And I'll show you one of the assessments that we use to do it. So the, the first handout that I have for you really summarizes these ideas about what is, uh, how does interdisciplinary learning work in the MYP. I'm bringing, uh, I, I think there's enough for everyone, I think anyway. Uh, would you just take a minute and see if you can choose one of the diagrams on this page and explain it to the person you're sitting with? Right. See if you can make an explanation. So we're, we're going to build up slowly, and this is, this is the, the base of our understanding. One of the things that I said that we talk, we talk about briefly are forms of integration because we said that interdisciplinary learning must be purposeful. You must have a reason to do it other than that somebody told you it was a good idea. Right? Why, why do you want to do it? Here's some examples. These are uh, six, way, six purposes. You might be able to synthesize. So an example of synthesis is uh, you're teaching uh, uh, Arabic as a, as a language to students who don't speak Arabic. Uh, but you want them to write a story in Arabic even though that's not their first or best language. Maybe it's even a short children's story. Maybe it's just the book of alphabets. But you are taking what you know about writing and you're using it in another language. You're really integrating in that way. Right? So that might be one possibility. Uh, personal expression. Um, you have an idea, a very important idea. Let's say this is an example about stereotypes, about how you should not, yes, you have a question? Yeah, let me finish this example, then we'll take your question, yeah? Um, you, you want to, you, there's the idea of stereotypes and you want people, students in your school, not to judge their fellow students on the basis of uh, what do they wear, right? So you don't want to stereotype people based on their outward appearance. But instead of um, having a classroom discussion, you've decided that you will write a song to explain how stereotypes work and why, the, why they're bad. Right? So that's an example. And you, you had a question. I was, uh, I was going to ask about the first one. Yes. Well, it's, if, we were, if, we were write, if we were writing, um, say, an alphabet book to teach the alphabet, you're probably you're integrating it, um, your ability to, first of all, to know the alphabet, right? So that if it's a, it, the language, right? And it could be art, arts. So if you're making an illustrated book or if you're telling a story, what are the nature, what's the nature of a good story? Just because it's in Arabic wouldn't make it a good story. It might be good Arabic, but a bad story. So the Arabic language might all be correct, but the story you're telling, the characters might be confusing and there might not really be a plot, and the setting might be, might be not, not described. So your understanding of literature 
might be is a different thing to add to your understanding of the grammar of Arabic. So you're combining those two things together. Well, this is just it. It depends. And, and probably, then that's if you're teaching this in an Arabic language class, the class is Arabic language, uh, but you're using an interdisciplinary way of teaching that subject. So it's, it could be one, or depending on how you organize your school, you might be getting grades for both. So that, that's, those are the logistics. We're talking more about the why do you do it and what good does it do. Is it considered interdisciplinary if you have language acquisition? It could be, depending on how, on how and why you do it, right? It's the, it's the purposefulness of it. So if you're doing, for instance, you're learning about story elements of the way of writing the story, and you can do an interdisciplinary way of teaching the story, would you consider that interdisciplinary? If you're, if you're teaching about the good elements of a story, yeah. right? Uh, and and you, you, you work with the design or with the art to design a yeah, story. Yeah, a story. Situation. Yeah. It could, be inter it could be, yeah, that's an example of how you would do it. You have a product in mind. So one of these things is a product, right, that you might plan now. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know if you have, the, if you have this debate um, in, in Jordan. May, may, maybe everybody just tells you when to come to school and there's no debate. Uh, but there are lots of debates in the United States these days about what time should school start. Yeah, well, adults would say 9 o'clock, maybe 10.30, maybe 1 in the afternoon, <laughs> maybe never at all. But people debate hotly because uh, there is some research that people say shows that students do better if they get to sleep later in the day, right? And so many people have had fights about uh, when, the, I don't know, do your students ever look like this fellow? Maybe they do, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> but for, this is my, these are my students in first period sometimes. So people have enormous fights about what time should school start? Should it start at 7.10 or 7.30 or 8 o'clock? What, what is the best time to start? Um, and if you were going to tackle this problem, the question I'd like you to think about is which discipline would be able to help you answer this question? Which discipline? So biology, maybe. What would you know from biology? So I hear media studies. I hear mathematics. Social studies. Psychology is possible. Physics is possible, yes, for the brain. And the physics of light has a lot to do with it, how the inside of your brain understands changes in day. Economics, because every time in America, every t there are buses that come, and every time you change the school bus schedule, it costs sometimes millions of dollars, depending on the thing. Uh, politics, because if it's a public school system, right, you have to understand who gets to make the decision and who has the power to make those decisions. It's really quite a complicated idea. Um, and so we, this is an, a, a messy interdisciplinary problem. And any, we might combine any of the two of those disciplines and come to different answers. I spoke to a biologist not long ago who said that this was the stupidest argument she'd ever heard because she had spent her career studying the inner parts of our brains um, that understand when to wake up and when to go to sleep. Basically, that, that's what they do. So if you travel on um, uh, jet, jet planes, these, these, are the, these are the little cells that are quite confused when you wake up in Asia. And, and you're, quite sh you're quite sure that the sun is up, but you would really like to have dinner and go to bed. So, because, because this, is, this is what she said, because uh, if, 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 if I moved to Australia, where the world is different, would I always act like I lived in Europe? No, eventually my body clock would reset itself, right? So guess what happens when you make school later for students? The body clocks just keep resetting themselves. Have any of you ever had, a, I, I think in Jordan, do you, you observe daylight savings yeah. time, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody ever have a little baby in daylight savings time? Yeah. Right, the baby doesn't know the first morning, right? It wakes up at the time it always wakes up, right? But in about 10 or 12 days, what happens? It's, it's back to the clock time when you want the baby to wake up, right? The, so our, the cells, she, she studied the particular cells in our brains and mathematically what happens is the cell, they, they really take a mathematical mean, the cell, there's not one cell that says day, night. There are thousands of them and it's a regular distribution and the next day it shifts a little bit to the left 
because the next day a few more cells get the idea and eventually most of the cells get the idea and your time is shifted. So this is a county in America that spent about um, uh, two, two million dollars to make the school schedule 20 minutes later and in a week and a half all the effects were gone biologically, right? Because they were interested in politics and economics and not biology, yes? So this has real world consequences for how you fit together which disciplines you choose to pay attention to, right? So this, this is my point about how, about how that works. So uh, in the middle years program, we have various ways of finding some common ground to talk about. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time about this, but the, the first thing is that we have some very big ideas that we believe are uh, applicable and can be used to get into any discipline. So uh, the idea is that you could take any one of these words and you could fold it up on a piece of paper and put it in a student's pocket. And if the student wandered around the, the school all day and took out the pocket and said, teacher, teacher, let's talk about this. You would say, oh yes, I would love to talk about that. For days and days I could talk about that. Identity. So in, in history class we talk about the identity of people, right? And I say, thank you teacher very much. Now we go to your class and I would say, ah, math teacher, would you like to talk about identity? And you would say, ah, yes, the identity, property, and multiplication. I would like to talk about identity a lot. Let me tell you a lot about identity. And I could fold it up and take it to you. Yes? Can we say that uh, problem solving approach and or project based learning or problem based learning as an interdisciplinary approach? Yeah, so the question is. is, is there's a difference between these two. Yeah, so it's a very good question. So I think he's asking does, a, does an approach to teaching, like a problem based learning approach, is that automatically interdisciplinary, right? Is that a, is that a thing you can bring? And I would say it depends on what, what do you do with it, because that could be an approach to teaching, a sort of a methodology that you use from place to place to place. But depending on how you're, you, how you're developing that, it might be a design way of thinking that you look at a problem and then you have so possible solutions to the problem, you design alternatives, you try to work them out, and then you evaluate to see if they were useful. Then we talk about design in the middle years program as a subject. And so by applying that design way of problem solving, it becomes an interdisciplinary exercise. So th it's possible. Yeah, it could be a methodology or it could be a discipline. Yeah, exactly. So the idea is that there are some big ideas that sweep across the disciplines and that we might be able to take one of those ideas and really get at the discipline by looking at that, about that concept. That's one way to do it. Um, there are related concepts, and so uh, this, be this becomes where the interdisciplinary learning becomes not just broad, but deep, right? So if we're, we were taking the example of, um, of a write writing, uh, writing a book in another language, the language and literature part of that might be character or theme or genre, right? The language, and, um, liter the language acquisition part might be grammar and voice um, and, um, and diction if I'm going to tell you, a st read the story to you orally. And when I put those two things together, then I'm really thinking like a language and literature teacher, and I'm thinking like a language acquisition teacher, right? And that's one of the ways we talk about it with students is, what kind of teacher would be thinking like you right now? Where would you go in the school to find somebody who's thinking like you're thinking, right, in those terms? And then the, other, the last bit that's specific to the middle years program in the IB, uh, our contexts. Yes? Yes? But I don't understand how do we use it as, as contrast or compare. Ah, okay. Yeah, Except so... Concepts and relationship. Yeah, and so there, if you, if you look at the giant table, and I brought the table to share with everybody of all the concepts that there are, you will find sometimes that the concepts um, are the, have the same word, but they mean something that's very different. So you, the related concepts can be an entry into interdisciplinary thinking. So identity is an example. Uh, the concepts are the same, but the meaning is a different subject. It could be. Or, or they might be concepts which compete against each other, right? Not the same concept. Not the same they're concept. Concepts, but, there's a, but there's something they share in common. You might be able to apply them to the same phenomenon. 
uh, and they would give you a different answer depending on which one you got. And you would say, why is that? Yeah. So that, that's the point, exactly. Yes? Yeah. The, they can't hear you in the translation room. Yeah. Would I be correct in saying, if you go to the slide, the concepts and relationships compare and contrast? This one? Uh, yes. What she was just yeah. asking you about. Would I be correct in saying and assuming that it would mean to explore the relationship between two different concepts within one uh, general idea or one? Uh, uh, I, I would I would say I issue, challenge, or phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. So, so something you could apply both. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if I had two subject groups and two different concepts, I would be uh, exploring the relationship of these two different concepts, each one in a different subject. Yes. And, and now we're talking just a tiny middle years asterisk, right? Because this is not a closed universe of concepts, right? So for example, if you look at sciences, it talks about transformation. Yes. But transformation might mean something very different in my literature class exactly or if I'm transforming um, a, 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 an equation in mathematics. So it could be the same concept with different meanings in different subjects. Yes. Or it could be two different concepts, one in each subject, subject but how it's applied yes. and how it impacts the other subject. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it, it works in, in, all, in all kinds of ways. It's a glorious mess, right? I just all wanted to make sure that I knew it right. And yeah, I yeah. It right. No. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what she was saying there, yes? Yeah, yeah the same idea. Yeah, so but I, I would, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, of a good example can for I, a contrast. Can I comment on that? Yes. Like previously when we were doing interdisciplinary units and we didn't have criteria for the interdisciplinary units. When we were trying to forge these interdisciplinary links, we were looking for links through content. So when we were looking for links through content, th this was very limiting. It became thematic. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So that was the problem. But now with the next chapter changes, we can find links between shared concepts, sh concepts and related concepts and between different concept, concepts and between contexts. So this has enabled us to explore even newer and more modes of thinking. Yes. We're not limiting ourselves. Yeah. Uh, as an example of, of, a, of a, one more example I'm thinking of in terms of beauty, right? right? That there, there are some people who would hold that, that the, the ideas of beauty are eternal. Right? If you look at like the Fibonacci sequence, that you can have characteristics that make a beauty something that doesn't change. But then you might find in history, when you study beauty, that it's very culturally determined. Mm -hmm. And if you look, for example, at what makes a beautiful female body, that's changed a lot over history and over culture. And so who is right, the math people or the history people? We're all talking about beauty, but we mean something very different. Right, and so that can even be the same word that's contrasting. But it might be timeless permanence, which is the way people think of math sometimes, and place, space, and time in history, which is changing all over, and how those concepts are in contradiction or contrast to each other gives you a way to look at a phenomenon, perhaps. Yeah? Uh, just a couple of words about global contexts. This is yet another way to enter interdisciplinary conversation. So thank you very much for that. Um, the global context offer an opportunity to look at um, how something is happening in the world or, or why it's important. Uh, often a, a challenge or an issue that we share. For example, you get the, the, the one that's that some people's minds a lot is climate change. Right? So how do you how do you take that and look at it through a variety of these concepts? Identities and relationships are very important, right, in terms of how people understand what their responsibility to where the earth is, where you are in space and time, people who have had a long history development as opposed to people whose countries are just beginning to develop economically, that, that matters a lot. Personal and cultural expression, how I, what, how I believe I are my rights to live, how I have my, my, the, my ability to express myself, how big is my carbon footprint, those are all aspects that go there. Scientific and technical innovation, can we 
um, use technology to work ourselves out of it, or is it not possible anymore? Is, is there no technology we can use? And is technology that brought us here, can it, can it deliver us? Globalization and sustainability, uh, an article in the paper I was reading this week about uh, a huge debate, is it possible to have a modern world that doesn't continue to grow? Is it possible? Uh, and the, ans the answer that, th that this author came up with is that probably not unless we want to have the world we had before the Industrial Revolution where growth became possible. Because if you're in a zero-sum world, the only way to make yourself better is if I take something from you. And that was, that was the world of constant war and, um, um, and, and life, life for most of human history. That so if everybody's doing a little bit better, that might be only possible if we continue to grow. But it has to be a growth that's controlled somehow because there's only one planet and eventually its resources are used. So how do we sort those things out? And then fairness and development. If, um, what, what if, 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 if my country has had a long time and has used more than its share of carbon, uh, is it fair then for that, for that country to cut way back on carbon so the countries who haven't had a chance have a chance to use that much carbon themselves? Is that fair or is that insanity? I don't know. So it gives us a chance to look at um, a, a phenomenon. We're using different disciplines perhaps to come to those decisions. And depending on how you decide to look at it, why is it important, you might come to different ideas. Yes? Hmm? Uh, it's because it's an old slide and I should have changed it. So, it, yeah, orientation is space and time. So, yeah, sorry, I should have changed that. Yeah, it should be orientation in space and time, OST. Yeah. So th those are some, uh, some things. So uh, now it's time to take a minute to think about how we might assess interdisciplinary learning. Uh, but I've been talking for a long while. Would you have a conversation about a time when you think you, have, as a teacher, have done something that's interdisciplinary? Not thematic, but interdisciplinary. Would you tell your conversation partner about a time when you think you've really done it? Okay. Stories about a time, oh sorry, I, I hope you've told some stories about a time when you were a good interdisciplinary teacher. Uh, I want to go to the next part very quickly because I want, uh, I really want you to have a chance to do two things and already we've had such good discussions I have to mark one of them out so I'm thinking fast as to which one we will, uh, we will not be able to do. Uh, when you talk about how you understand interdisciplinary learning, it's very difficult sometimes to know what the it is. Right? How do you identify the thing that's really the interdisciplinariness, if that's a word, of, of this learning event? How do you describe it? And so for the first time in the review of uh, MYP, we, we identified particular criteria for interdisciplinary learning as if it were its own subject group. And we treat it that way to some extent because we want to raise its importance in the school to make sure that there's a particular way of learning and going about learning that's important. And so we have four criteria that are tied deeply to the, uh, the inquiry cycle. And they start with the disciplines. So you have to have disciplinary understanding. That's the first criterion. Then we look at how you put things together and synthesize as the model. And then we, the synthesis takes place inside your head. Right? You can't really see synthesis. So you have to be able to communicate what you've come to, the new understanding you've come to. So communication is there. And then we ask something that's very difficult for grown-ups, much less for 16-year-olds, is that you should be able to step back out of this and look at it from a distance and describe what's happened inside your head. Very difficult to do. So that's the metacognitive reflection on the interdisciplinary learning process. Now, that, doesn't have, that sounds a lot worse than it is to some extent, but it does mean being able to do even some very simple things like, ah, that's the way math teachers think. Mm. Ah, that's something a history teacher would say. That's already the beginning of interdisciplinary <coughs> understanding, right, seeing how that works. And then it also then has something to do with me as a learner. 
right? And I'll, I think I will demonstrate that in just a moment, that uh, as an historian, I'm always going to be more convinced, this is not a true statement, this is not about me, this is about what, what somebody might say. As an historian, I'm always going to be more convinced if I have concrete numerical data that enforces, that persuades me of the argument, right? So if, I, if I'm going to say, who suffered most in World War II? Who suffered most? Who? Which people suffered most? Well, if I were the sort of person who was convinced only by numerical data, I would count up the number of deaths or the percentage of population killed and injured, and then whatever number was highest, I would have my answer. Yes? Yeah. yeah. But I know that about myself as a learner. I don't, this is not, it's not what I believe, but that's, yeah. that, that would be one way to do it. But I would know that I find mathematical analysis much more persuasive in historical argumentation than I do uh, a, um, someone's narrative history, yeah? So as a, as a, as a learner and as a, a, a contributor to and a receiver of understanding, I begin to think that I think more like the math teacher than I do the art teacher. Or I might come up with a problem and think, ah, oh, if I just had the right numbers, I could solve that. But if the question is, how do we solve global warming in a way that's fair, mm, numbers might not be the only thing I need. So being able to think about that concept is, is an age-appropriate interdisciplinary thing. And it moves quickly if you're an IB diploma school in, into theory and the theory of knowledge because these are particular ways of knowing. And so we really are lining up students to be self-critically aware of how they think and how they come to decisions. So those are the criteria. So my computer, the reasons I don't understand, wants to go to sleep. <laughs> Yeah. It should be okay. <clears throat> uh, so those are the criteria. I want to spend a lot of time with them. Um, and then we're going to move to look at, um, I'm going to try to rescue both, both activities very fast. Um, when we look at how we're going to assess this in the middle years program, this is the blueprint and the tasks and how the criteria get reflected together. The criteria are equal. There are three tasks. Um, they, they, they look like that. The biggest one, of course, is the synthesis and communication of that understanding and synthesis. And then reflecting is also there. <coughs> this is e assessment. Yeah, yeah. So for the examination, that's 120 marks. Yeah. And the marks are divided equally among the criteria. Yeah. Uh, and and this, uh, this way of thinking, we always take two subject groups. And the two subject groups are always going to be from these four because these are the four everyone must do, yes? And because we're not capable yet of managing language acquisition and all the possibilities that that would raise. Is that actually a problem that we're facing when it comes to language and literature and language acquisition? We have students, like for example, who are year one, half are in language acquisition and the others. Please get the opportunity to go through the interdisciplinary learning, mm -hmm. whereas the language acquisition kids, because um, it's different material, it's different the curriculum, they don't. That's so not the language acquisition course, but students who are learning the language of instruction, you mean? The language acquisition course, yeah. It's different from what we're doing in language and literature. Yeah, so but you should, you, um, but everyone has language and literature also, yes? No. They have to. It's language and literature. Yeah, they, they must, yeah, yeah, they do. So the, the examination always will be some combination of those subjects, right? So Two of the four. Or the ones that are the ones no, all the four. So the ones that are on the, the ones we're going to look at now used these two subjects. That's why they're in red. But any two subjects can play, right? So any combination. You could do language and math. You could do science and individual societies. You could do all sorts of things. Yeah? Yes? Right, they're not part of the ex Yes. Okay. Yeah, so this is only for E assessment, not, not, not for all teaching and learning, right? And the reason that the E portfolio subjects are not there is that in grade 10, not everybody has to take all eight subject groups.
What? Well, yeah, for e assessment. No, so I'm just talking about what we're going to see here. And the point is not to, not to get into e assessment, which was yesterday, but to look at these, these two ideas. And this is where we're going with the example. Uh, because transdisciplinarity is complicated, in this examination, we always are giving students pre release material. So you don't arrive at the exam going, ah, oh, what is this about? You've had six weeks to think about the idea and to talk about it with teachers and to even do more research if you want to do. You don't have to do. Um, but the interdisciplinary um, resources are quite rich. They're, they have lots of different kinds of texts. Some of them are uh, discursive prose, right, that is really like a newspaper article that's at the high end of reading scales. Some of them are mixed text that even in the text itself combines multiple subject groups. Some of them are video texts that um, you're able to see and hear and listen to a story. Right? Some of them are um, complex visual texts that have words and that have um, 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 images put together. Right? So they go in different ways. Then the examination uses those materials, sometimes plus additional material that you haven't seen before, to ask a series of questions. It's not just one big question that you write for 120 minutes, but it gets at a variety of ways of thinking about synthetic uh, and communicative um, understandings. And often the synthetic part of this is being able to understand some and analyze somebody else's synthesis, right? So you can see what's going on. The communication is often then the productive side of making it on your own. So, um, how much time? Who's, what? How much time do we have? Fifteen minutes? Yeah, yeah. Ten minutes, even less. Yeah. So, um, I think we will have to skip the water example because I want you to be able to do this. So, I'm going to show you a, a tiny bit, um, and you'll have to you'll have to listen to Pooja again just for a few minutes to hear her story, and then I want to show you how. I'll pause there. sure why he seems to be stuck. Mm. I might need technical assistance. Oh, here we go. Now I'm ready to go again. So this is going to show you a couple of things about the interdisciplinary exam. It's a, a screenshot. Uh, the point is you can move around and to see. And the pre-release material, there are a variety of tasks that I showed you. Um, this is an example of a, a very simple short thing that's available for kids that has uh, images. This is a mathematical graph, right, Just to be able to understand information that's in uh, graphical form. Then uh, the third source is a video. My name is Pooja. This is Rajasthan, the place where I live. People in my community think that educating girls is a complete... So I'm going to pause Pooja just for a moment so that I can show you another part. I'm sorry, the computer is going to be difficult and we're running out of time. So I want to hand you a, a handout and describe what you might have seen here instead. It's, it's, uh, you can get the idea. Um, if we're asking you to, for in this example, it was to look at individuals and in societies and language and literature. 
So the task was to look at um, a couple of, actually three, social media posts, right? One is from Julie Gillard, who's the former Prime Minister of Australia. And it basically says, I'm Julia Gillard, I'm important, do this because I said so. It's a tweet. She says, I'm Julia Gillard, this is important, do it. Right? Another one is from the United Nations, and it has uh, a, a very complicated box and, whis box and whisker graph right? of describing which countries do good in education, which countries do poorly in education for all. Right? Then the third is a Facebook post that has the picture of a very cute young Syrian boy who's, been, uh, who's a refugee and hasn't been to school in, in so many months. And it tells how many people are like him and how many countries have this. So it's a, an emotional visual text. And so the first question for students is, OK, uh, which of these texts do you find to be most persuasive and why? All right? Because is looking at how do you combine what you know about persuading people from language and literature with the actual facts of, uh, from social studies of how education for all is an important uh, universal goal for the United Nations and for humanity. So if you really want people to understand this, you have both the content. I could list out all these facts and bullet points. It would be same, the same content. But I can't use all the content. So did I choose good content? Is this, is, this persuade, is this relevant? Is it true? Is it accurate? Is it reliable? Those are history kinds of questions. And then if the goal is to persuade you to charge and really want to be a part of this cause for universal education, those are language and literature questions. How do I convince people? How do I use emotions and rhetoric um, how do I create a complex visual text? I'm sorry you can't see it, but you can imagine a Facebook post that has not just a picture with the, with the just gorgeous little Syrian boy, but you can barely see his face because there are numbers and little bubbles posted all around it. Right? So I might say in a visual text, one of the things that's important is not to overwhelm people with information. I know that because I've studied the nature of visual text in my language and literature course. So when you put those two things together, then you get the answer to which of these is the most persuasive post and why. And when you're answering that question, you're, you're really communi you're, you're being able to synthesize, uh, you're able to make measurements and to judge the student's ability to see and synthesis. Right? That, that's what's going on there. You've done a very good job with your imaginations. Thank you for imagining while the screen isn't there. Then if we move to the next criteria, Right? Uh, the, last, the last handout I have for you, and you'll have to, uh, to work really amazingly quickly. Can I have two helpers? Thank you. Here, here are two examples from the pre-release material. And if I want to ask you to communicate understanding, I would say don't worry about understanding and, and analyzing somebody else's synthesis. Here's a blank piece of paper. Here's some information. Now you make a social media post that you think would get your friends interested in this topic. How would you synthesize what you know about education for all from the pre-release material or from other conversations you've had or what you already know? How would you use that yourself to communicate this synthetic understanding, right? And if we had enough time and energy, then I would ask you to take these, uh, these two pieces and with a piece of paper at your table, Draw yourself a, um, a, 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 Twitter, a Twitter box and find 140 characters plus an image that you would want to tweet to all of your friends around the world to say, hey, you must do something about education for all. There are people around the world who don't have a chance to go to school. How, why don't you join me in fighting for this cause? Yeah. So that, that's how we would get at the, the idea of communication. Can you communicate interdisciplinary understanding? You might make a very beautiful um, and persuasive and emotionally graphic picture, but people would say, that's just a cute kid. Why should I, what is important about that? Oh, cute little Syrian boy, yeah? Or you might then have just a list of facts and say, 25 reasons. Uh, can you get 25 reasons, 140 characters? Probably not. Uh, t ten, 10 reasons with 14 characters each why education for all is important. 
it probably might not be that persuasive either. So you have to use what you know about the topic, social studies, and what you know about being persuasive to get people to agree with your point of view and move them to action. When you put those things together, then you're getting it inter interdisciplinarity. And then the last part of the exam is, is on reflection when you might say, okay, never mind these two subjects. Think of another subject that you've had in NYP, another subject group that you've, you've encountered. How could you use things from that to make people even understand this complex idea better, right? Could you use things from art? Could you use things from, you know, uh, design? How would you build something, right? So in that last piece, it's, it's about students' ability to take this thing we've led them through on the examination and do it really with a blank, literally a blank page that's there. Uh, I want to show you two more fast pictures and I'll leave this with you because I would love for you to go back and make an interdisciplinary unit that deals with these two pictures. Is that an okay way to end? I think I can make the machine do it. Let's see. <laughs> Good. So, do you recognize this? It's the Jordan River, yes, about uh, two kilometers from here. And I think it's May of 2012, that's when this picture came. Hello. Yeah. So, here's one picture, right? And then here's another picture from the United Nations. Hmm. It, it's really the same place, but from a different, a different perspective, yes? And one of the things I learned in doing my research for this, this presentation is that Jordan is the third, second. is it moved to second, at least? Yeah, well, but the, the third most in danger of, uh, of, of not having any water at all, ever, yeah. So how do, you, how, how do you understand how these images relate to each other? What disciplines do you need to solve this problem, my friends in Jordan? Science you need, economics you need, geology you need, politics you need, development you need, yeah, religion you need, <laughs> yes, all, all these things. So how you, how you look at a complex problem like this and an opportunity and, and a land that's always been a dry land, yes, for, for millennia, this is, a, this is a dry place. But how, how, do we, how do we live together on an increasingly hot, crowded and dry planet? Uh, is something that only interdisciplinary study can solve. And you can't wait until you're a postdoctoral student to start thinking like this. There's not enough time. So please invite your students into the conversation. Uh, and I will look forward to finding on the Online Curriculum Center the wonderful units about water in Jordan. Yes? Good. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Thank you.